Rain Murata started selling fruit from his bike at Miami Farmers Market. Now he's got a thriving fruit farm that he ships all across US and Canada. Today we're going to find out how he started with $200 in his pocket and grew to a blooming sustainable business. We ship the product after we get the order. We don't harvest the product and then try to sell it. Mm. And these opportunities are always presenting themselves, so you have to be on social media now as a small business. You know, 30 to 50,000 a month on yes. marketing? Yes. This is a fruit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big thanks to Masterworks for sponsoring this video. Guys, I'm standing here at Miami Fruit Farm, a local business that has grown over the last few years. And Rain shares exotic and rare fruits to his neighbors, growers, and ships all across U.S. and Canada. Nice to meet you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. What a, an accomplishment, I got to tell you. I mean, it's a beautiful farm. We walked around just before we started this. But let's start with your story and how you got into the fruit market or fruit business in general. Well, it's a long story. Uh, how much time we got? 30, 60 seconds. <laughs> All right. Um, I started selling fruit off my bicycle. I didn't have a driver's license. I was living in a trailer in my mom's backyard. I was just really passionate about taking our local fruit that we grow here in Homestead and bringing it to farmer's markets in Miami. So mm -hmm. I peddled the fruit, literally, from farm to market. Basket front back, or how did you load up the bike? It was a custom-built aluminum trailer. I could load up to about 500 pounds maximum. Wow. I would post my bike trailer and the fruit from the markets on social media. People would ask me, hey, where can I get this fruit? I'm in Wisconsin, I'm in New oh, wow. York, and can you mail me a box? And then before I knew it, people online were asking me to send it to them across the country. One thing led yeah. to another. Yeah. Amazing. How long after you unofficially started your business, right, selling fruits on a bike, mm -hmm. before you said, you know what, it's time to take it to the next level? Well, I wanted to move out from my mom's house. That was kind of important. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> she wanted to move out, actually. It was important to, to invest back into what we were doing, mm -hmm. to produce something that was going to be able to sustain us for our lives, mm -hmm. and to give back to the agricultural community. So it took us around four or five years from starting to make enough money to buy a small piece of land back then. And you yeah. said you saved up and paid cash for mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. in the initial chunk. Mm -hmm. Wow, good for you. What's the overhead for you to run this small farm? Like, what's the significant cost every month? So I think the most significant costs are shipping, shipping the actual product, maybe 20 to 30 on shipping. And then the amount of product, I mean, 20, yeah. 30 a week on products. You know, labor, we've got 10 to 20 people that are full-time, so you can do the math on that. Okay. We spend 30 to 50 a month on advertising. You know, 30 I, to 50,000 a month yes. on marketing? Yes, and these are rough numbers because I'm mm -hmm. more focused on long-term growth than just Good pushing for you, right? you know, to confirm, I'm going to do a wild guess, but you're probably well over a million in revenue on a yearly basis. Is revenue the one before or the after? Before. Yeah, we, we, we definitely are, are moving a lot of fruit and we're yes, focused on like. long-term growth. Sweet. Yeah. How much did it cost you to buy this entire farm? And how did you finance it? Are there any financing options for others watching us right now to start there? Well, I saved up my pennies and didn't want to get a loan. So that was my first goal. Back when I got the first farm where we're standing, it was around $60,000 an acre. And today, the yeah. same farmland costs over $200,000 per acre. Wow. Are we talking eight years ago? Or we're talking the time frame? 2017, so that's four or five years ago. Sheesh. And now things are blown up. Do you know about any bank loans programs that there are, are out there? There are tons of agricultural and farming loans for small farmers, organic farmers. You really have to get in touch with your local agricultural area mm -hmm. and see what options are available. But there are tons of financing options available for small growers, women growers, mom and pop growers, and organic farmers. I honestly feel like I'm in an oasis. <laughs> the waterfall sound, the beautiful crystal clear water. This is pretty cool. So let's continue and talk about where can I start, right? A lot of people are limited saying, I have no money, I can't do anything. It doesn't really matter whether it's farming or anything else in life, you gotta start somewhere. And I think it's important to get involved in the community and learn and try to find a value that you can add to the community. I mean, in a way you found a niche, mm -hmm. right? How Absolutely. important is looking for a niche or does it, appear to you and you're like, oh my gosh, that's a niche. Do you look for it? They're everywhere. How did it happen for they're, you? they're totally everywhere. You have to be receptive to it and have an open mind, I think, because people are always looking for more connectedness with their food and their community. And these opportunities are always presenting themselves, but they usually take a ton of work. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not willing to do the work, you won't find the opportunity. 
What does exceptional customer service look like for you? How do you provide that to your customers? Well, I think uh, you may have seen this too. A lot of people entering e-commerce think, oh man, well, I don't need a physical storefront. I don't need to deal with the customers. And on an online store, you spend the same amount of time talking to the customer as you would a retail physical location. I can see that. So yeah. the customer needs their questions answered before they purchase, after they purchase and they're waiting for their product, once they've received their product, once they've eaten their product. So they have questions all along the way and you have to be there and provide answers for them. So we try to create as much content and resources on the website as possible. So a ripening guide, a season guide, wow. videos with recipes, how to tell when it's ripe videos. So we have a handful of videos about it. <laughs> and then we've got guides and you know QR codes that come in the box that you can kind of learn and educate yourself. So basically all the resources that I potentially would need are on your website. Potentially, and no matter how many resources you have, you still have to talk to the customers and make sure that they're understanding and finding the resources and utilizing them to their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your shipping methods. With tropical fruits, in general, the key is freshness and optimal ripeness and harvesting at peak ripeness. Some of these tropical fruits, they can't go below 60 degrees for more than a few hours. All right. So we have to pick the fruit, harvest it fresh, and ship it the same day. A lot of these fruits, they're harvested, and within hours, they're in a box and on a plane wow. going to their customer. Okay. Some of these products, they're not off the tree for more than 16 hours before the customer gets them. That's so cool. Yeah, so it's really important that, that time is of the essence when we're harvesting and shipping. Typical box, what's the cost for me to, sh to, to order one? It's about a hundred bucks with shipping and everything. Shipping. As far as packaging materials go, we do our part to give back to the environment. We use recycled cardboard, recycled wood shavings, recycled paper, and then we make our own products here to ship the fruit in an eco-friendly way. Hence yeah. the hundred dollars to me is like, perfect. Yeah. I'll pay it any day. Yeah. Like what were the best strategies to get your name out there as a small fruit farm? I think we, we use social media mainly, and then also sharing our product with YouTube channels that are on brand, maybe it's a gardening channel or mm -hmm. a fruit channel, and just sending out boxes to people that we resonated with and felt like we're good partners to work with. I think that's really important too, to get the word out there and to piggyback on other people's, you know, add value to someone's community mm -hmm. and they can add value to yours. Man, so if there wasn't any social media, gosh, what would be the alternative to that, you know, in these day and age? This is the future, right? This is where we're at. So you have to be on social media now as a small business. TikTok, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook is the yeah. deal. Yeah. Guys, keep watching to hear more about their marketing strategies as a small fruit farm on how to get your name out there and market your product. All right, let's talk about your competitive advantage here at Miami Fruit. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got competitors. What do you want to highlight? Well, I think what we're doing different is, is that we're broadening in diversity. So we don't just want more sales of the same thing. We want to offer things that are new and exciting to the customers and really respond to that demand and lean into that niche that we've, that we've already started. So always looking for new products to grow, always looking for new products to source, and then providing new options for people along the way. But at some point, you probably will cycle through all the fruits that are out there in Florida, right? <laughs> That's I mean, the thing is, I mean, there's a when, lot of when does it end before you start repeating the cycle again? Well, uh, we're, we've, we've done most of what I've been able to find in Florida, but <laughs> we're growing new products now that we can, every season, you know, three times a year, we'll have a new product that we've grown. Such as? Um, well, such as peanut butter fruit that's now on our website. Oh, wow. Fruit that tastes like peanut butter. How cool is that? Dude, that's so cool. Yeah. Right? So we're, we're trying new things, and then we also want to keep things fresh by offering new assortments of fruits. So we've got uh, a lot of great citrus in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. and we have a fruit that changes your taste buds called the Miracle Fruit. So we've got a box called the Miracle Citrus Box where you take you eat one of these little berries, and then all of a sudden you can bite into a lemon. It tastes like the sweetest lemonade you've ever had. What? So we've got- That's a cool experience, dude. Trying to keep things fresh, even though you know the fruits are the same, we're putting them together in a new, a new arrangement that's exciting for the customer. I like that. Yeah. So you're, you're more than just selling fruits. You're yeah. selling an experience. Absolutely. And this this orchestra in in my palate. Well, you'll that probably I'm willing to pay whatever I'm willing yeah. to pay for. You'll probably see in the comments, wow, hundred dollars for a box of fruit. Yeah. Well, in this box of fruit, you might have ten or twenty new fruits that you can't really find at your grocery store. Yeah. And. Um, for hundred bucks, you're spicing up the kitchen, you're spicing up your meals for the next few weeks. Yeah. People go out and spend hundred dollars on a, on a meal or a bottle of wine even. And um, this experience can last you a long time and can really add a lot of value to your life through over the weeks of the months. That's amazing. Yeah. Awesome, Rain, this is a freaking cool looking plant. Like, yeah. What, what is these? this stuff? 
These are mame sapote, and mame this sapote. fruit tastes like sweet potato pie. But it's a great example of the quality control and the lengths that we go to make sure that it's a quality product. Every single fruit has to be scratch tested for color to make sure that the color is a dark orange. What are you looking for? We're looking for so a dark orange. That's every, not ready yet. Before we pick every fruit, we get there in by, by hand and scratch them. So these fruits, the season's just starting. Okay. We have to go through every fruit and check before we pick it. All right, cool. What's next? Oh, and one more thing about yeah. this one is uh, from flower to fruit, each fruit takes two years to grow. So you can see these little flowers here. When it fruits, they'll be growing on the tree for two years. So if you have a hurricane and they knock your fruit off, you're set back two years. This is a fruit? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the most challenging part of starting a fruit farm, apple orchard farm? Let's, let's go general and talk mm -hmm. about farms in general. What do you think? In today's age of, of agricultural economy, the most challenging part is to find products that are going to be valuable. So making sure that you have enough diversity in your offerings that you've got a secure market for what you need to sell and what mm -hmm. you need to move, that it's not going to get undercut by a, a foreign market that you know, or import that's much cheaper to produce in another country. So the most challenging part is is finding a product that you know will sell mm -hmm. and that you know you'll, there will be a profit margin on it. You mentioned diversity a lot, and that, that's great, but I also think of other businesses that are focused and hyper-focused on one product, mm -hmm. and they do well with that. Well, we've, um, got, we've got issues on hand like climate change. We've got exports and, and imports from other countries are coming in more than ever, and they'll continue to grow in, in diversity as well. Mm -hmm. And they're always going to be cheaper than what we can produce here with American labor and American land value and all that jazz. So in a sense, in a larger sense, that is diversity, offering something that is isn't really out there. Mm -hmm. We're offering something that would be hard to do at a, at a massive scale. If you're not prepared to fail, then you're really putting all your eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. right? Like so that. diversity in a sense, maybe try, try three different things and learn from that and be prepared to fail. What about crew and what are you paying them on average? Just curious, like how, how that's set up. Our system works where we have a base rate that doesn't matter if you a master's degree in fruit science or you're straight out of jail you know everyone comes in and starts because everyone has to learn how to pack a box and how to weigh the fruit and sort the fruit there's a lot of details to mm -hmm. learn so everybody comes in and does training and does a base rate but really our payment system depends on the value someone creates so if you if you come in and you work really hard and you want to take on leadership and and care about the business you know the sky's the limit so we have people paid anywhere from $15 an hour to like $35 an hour. Wow. Yeah. Okay, pretty, pretty good for yeah. Florida. What vehicles do you think the ultra wealthy use to help protect and invest their wealth, especially in tough economic times like today? Well, if you've guessed contemporary art, you're absolutely right. In the past, the top 1% would assemble teams of experts just to help them acquire fine arts with price tags as high as $450 million. I don't know about you, but that's a few million dollars outside of the Upflips budget. The good news is it's in the past. Today, Masterworks has evened the playing field for you and me. You too can help protect, diversify, and invest your wealth like the top 1%, and maybe even have an unfair advantage with Masterworks' incredible team of experts. A team that only in the last three years has generated 10, 13, and 35% returns for investors. But with over 600,000 members and art from legendary artists like Banksy and Picasso means a never-ending waitlist of art that sells out in minutes, but not for Upflip viewers. Start your very own art collection today with Masterworks and turn a real asset into a real investment. Masterworks is offering Upflip viewers priority access to their new offerings. Simply click the link in the description below to get in on this incredible opportunity. Tell us about the most popular products that you sell consistently. Mm -hmm. I know we're always talking about diversity, but give us a list of things that are on mm -hmm. your list that people really love and reorder and reorder. Yeah. So we have a ton of fruits that you probably never heard of, like mame, sapote, sapodilla, egg fruit, chocolate pudding fruit. You know, we've got tons of so options. Cool. But the most popular product on our site is the variety box because every week it's a little bit different. Everything is in season that week. Get it while it's here and you get to try 10 to 20 different varieties of fruit and learn about these fruits along the process. So that's definitely the, the highlight of our website is get a variety box. Every week of the year, it's gonna be a little bit different. Cool, well, tell you what, why don't we guys show you the exact thing that we're talking about. Let's go pack a box and ship it to me, right? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. 
Talk to us about what you have in your hand first, because I'm wondering, like, if I want just this fruit, do I have the option to just order this fruit full of, right. you know, full in the box? Or absolutely. So give us give us an understanding of what our options so are. So this, yeah, this is a, one of our variety boxes we have on the site. So this is a, a weekly uh, assortment of what's in season, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't get to choose what's in it. It's it's everything that we've got. Then you could also order each product individually if you'd like. And so everything that's in the variety box is also available to be purchased individually. Yeah, first thing when you open the box, you get a little pamphlet that's nice and colorful and has all the information about us, what we do, where the fruit comes from, what our packaging is made out of, uh, what to do when you get your box with a QR code so you can scan it and you can see what all the fruits are, the names mm -hmm. of the fruits, how to tell when they're ripe, recipe videos, everything's so cool. right there. You can just scan it and check it out. You gotta read the pamphlet, that's, that's yeah, important. Yeah, don't just uh, take it out. <laughs> and cut everything open. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so tropical fruit, a lot of it, you know, has to ripen properly. It has to get soft. It's not like an apple where you can just eat it. Hmm. So um, it is really important. And, and so we try to, you know, make sure that the customers are aware of that. Share with us the seasonality of what you do. You know, are you shipping the same fruits January through December, or are there really slow months versus busy months? Just want to kind of understand that better. So we grow and sell hundreds of different products, hundreds of different types of fruit, and they change throughout the seasons. Okay. I think it's important to offer new things throughout the season anyway, so no matter what the business, because variety is a spice of life. And I think in our business, what we have to offer that's a value is that when the fresh produce in the U.S. is so-so, say mm -hmm. in the winter time, when getting high quality, fresh, sweet, delicious fruit is more of a challenge, we have a ton of delicious tropical fruit that we can send throughout the winter. Mm -hmm. So as a lot of fruit businesses may be more popular in the summer up north, in the winter is where we really thrive because we have all this fresh product produced right here. That's awesome. Yeah. Guys, make sure you check out our podcast. We have incredible interviews with really successful business owners. So do that today after this episode. These are like dinosaur fruits, dude. These are absolutely incredibly unique looking. I've never seen anything like that. Have you guys? Comment below, love to hear from you. So you're shipping fresh fruits to people all over the country, mm -hmm. Canada as well. Guessing sometimes you get a customer complaint once in a while. Mm -hmm. What systems do you have to make sure that that customer at the end of the day, happy and satisfied? Share some experiences with us. Again, we talked about customer service and having a ton of resources available and then people available to answer emails and questions like that. Shipping products, shipping perishable product is difficult. Sometimes uh, there's a storm, there's shipping delays, there's cold weather that damages the fruit mm -hmm. or, you know, customer could not know how to eat the fruit and let it go rotten or eat it too soon. So it's, it's important to have a robust refund policy and exchange policy so that you can make sure that, you know, you're giving the customer all the opportunity to get the product and have a great experience. And if they neglect it, then, you know, it's on them. So. When I buy, do you give me instructions? I say, hey, when you get it, you know, we don't want you to keep it for a month, you know, a week yeah. in the fridge. I'm guessing yeah, it's all so, in there. You know, again, with email communications, you know, when they place the order, they're getting a confirmation email with some resources. When mm -hmm. the order ships, they get tracking number. And the tracking can be really uh, beneficial as well because you can get updates on your phone. Oh, the package just got delivered to your doorstep. You know, it's snowing outside. Make sure you bring it in. Mm -hmm. um, stuff right. like that. So there's a lot of uh, resources available to use the, the technology we have to communicate with the customer on every step of the way. All right, blitz time with rain. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Goldforth for submitting a question. We really appreciate that. How much inventory do you keep? What part of the inventory spoils and how do you plan for demand and ensure sufficient supply? That's uh, a very complicated and, and difficult part of what we do, but that's also the crux of it is yep. harvesting everything optimally ripe and shipping it right away. So we get orders and then we ship the product after we get the order. We don't harvest the product and then try to sell it. I see. Thank you for Laszlo Peter Guarmati for submitting this question. How does rain find the fruitiest locations? I bike around the area and look for fruit and then knock on the door and, and offer to buy it. What's the furthest you have to bike out to find something? Uh, you know, probably 60, 70 miles. What? Yeah. On a bike? Yeah. What about cars? Well, what about them? What happened Screw to that? cars. All right. <laughs> How did he build his cart and what inspired him to start selling fruit? The, the fruit cart? Yes, Inception okay. Day. I didn't want a car, I didn't have a license. I had a couple hundred bucks and I went to the local welder and asked him to build me a bike trailer. Dude, that's so and, cool. And uh, props to the old man who did it. He was a legend. That's cool, yeah. dude. All these bugs, sorry. And last question here, asked by uh, Michaelis Cristo Daulu. What was the turning point when he realized he had grown into a larger business? 
Oh, I, there's been no turning point for me. It's just constant work every day. You That's know, um, this could be a small point in my career or it could be the highlight, who knows? That's true. Yeah. You're just beginning. Maybe. As a farmer, how do you manage time, workflow? Obviously for you, this is your life, this is your baby. But for somebody watching out there struggling because he's always on his farm, he's got to live a little. What are your tips or advice? Uh, a pair of AirPods goes a long way, right? I always have the AirPods For what in. purpose? So I can be harvesting fruit, answer the phone call, you know, tell Siri to call someone. I, I just find it's very uh, efficient to have AirPods in all the time. I took them out for the filming, <laughs> but but yeah, I think I think utilizing technology that we have, I almost never go on a desktop except for a couple archaic mm. apps where I can't do it on my phone. But I spend probably six hours a day on my phone and that'll be all over the farm and all over the town. So you're multitasking. Um, multitasking all the time. But utilizing efficient ways of, of communication, efficient ways of, of payment, paying growers, you know, through electronic means, you know, like if you're still going to the bank to deposit checks, it's like, yeah, efficient. you know, you can, you can do that on your phone, you can deposit checks, you can write checks, you can wire money from your phone. So I think there's a lot of tools on your phone that you don't have to be at a place behind a desk with a computer. That's a lot, a big time saver. What's your strategy for finding new growers, new suppliers? As you mentioned, you want a variety always, mm -hmm. right? I think it's important to do a little bit of everything. So first things first, do it yourself. We're trying to grow hundreds of new varieties for our customers. So that's a long-term investment. In the meantime, finding local growers, I try to talk to other growers about who they know that's growing, growing exciting things. I ride my bike around the dirt roads here and I just look for, look at the products that are growing and, <laughs> and yell at some farmers, hey, you know, you wanna, <laughs> you wanna sell me that? So kind of everything, going to local ag agriculture meetings and being part of the agriculture community, you can get connected with people that are doing new and exciting things in your area. And uh, yeah, again, always trying new things. So if you throw 100 darts at the wall, probably one of them's gonna stick. Mm -hmm. So we've done that with, with products here on our farm, growing hundreds of different varieties of fruits mm -hmm. to see what might grow here. Tell us about the group that you have, the team here, right? Mm -hmm. When you got started, who was involved? What was his or her role? And where are you at today in terms of employees? Yeah, when we first started, it was basically just me and my partner, Adele. We work really well together. That partnership is really important, I think, because I've been able to focus a lot on purchasing and managing uh, new workers and fulfillment of orders. And she's been able to focus specifically on marketing, content creation, social media management, and website development. The products on the website, the ripening guides, all the videos that you see on social media, all of the emails email marketing, text marketing, campaigns, all of that stuff she works on and creates daily. So we kind of have a, a yin yang partnership where, mm -hmm. where she, she works on all that stuff and I answer the phone and focus on bills and focus on management of workers and uh, you know making sure the orders get out on time. We've got golden berries. Can I try one? Yes, of course. All right, just eat the whole thing? Or yeah, just I... eat the whole thing. Ooh, wow, that's delicious, that's like, Tangerine, mm -hmm. orange, mm -hmm. together, married. Yep, and, and it's one of the highest vitamin C fruits on the planet. Wow. Mm -hmm. mm. What's the biggest source of uh, headache for you as a farmer right now? I think environmental concerns are always a big headache for, mm -hmm. for growers. You know, climate change, uncertainty of weather. But then you just have your normal hurricanes come in and decimate crops. Busting so everything up. That's, that's always something to be aware of. The, potential losses you will have and be prepared for those losses. If you're not prepared to take heavy hits, you're destined to fail as a grower. So how do you prepare then? Economically prepare, be ready for, uh, you know, not getting the profit that you expect immediately. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you can grow, Preserves. you can grow a new orchard for three or four or five years and a hurricane can wipe it out. So wow. um, we're also investing into a trellis system that's gonna be protecting against hurricanes. So being prepared to get knocked down and stand back up again. Have reserves, have, have the ability to stand up again if, you, if it doesn't work out. So you've got quite a following on Facebook, Instagram. It's a big part of your business. Absolutely. When did that start to really change and impact the business in a positive way? Who's in charge of it? What can you share to other farmers that yeah. are not utilizing social media on what well, they I should think, do today? You know, it's, you have to start somewhere. And like I said earlier, my whole business started from people on social media looking at my personal account, seeing the fruits that I was posting. Mm -hmm. So perfection is sometimes the enemy of, of someone who's trying to get out there because you just gotta, like you just gotta put stuff out there. And then consistency, we've, uh, you know, Adele does all the social media, so props go to her, not me. But she's posted every day for the last seven or eight years, you know? 
every single day, sometimes three times a day. Oh, wow. And just get it out there. And, and the other aspect too is, is try to improve. Always try to create higher quality content. And if every time you make a post, if every time you put something out there, it's your best for that day, then sometime you're gonna get lucky and something will go viral. It's relentless, uh, you know, social media presence. Right. And, and providing something that's valuable to a viewer, not just a customer, mm -hmm. but somebody who wants to learn about what, what is this fruit? Maybe they'll never buy it from you, but they're they're engaged and they're excited and they'll share that with other people and maybe one of those people will buy. Absolutely. Yeah. Dude, well said. You guys, if you're enjoying this video, like I am, like all of us are, take a second, like the video. We appreciate that. Why don't other growers that you connect with mm -hmm. do what you're doing? I don't understand. Anyone can do what we're doing. Right, I think but they're that not. I think that the key to our success is that we're making it as benef mutually beneficial for the growers as possible. So yeah, we're yeah. paying higher prices in general than the average wholesale price for fruit. And we're taking care of our growers by being consistent. I think it's also difficult to manage an e-commerce business, right. an online store, do customer service, and only have a small farm or you know, 10, 20 acres to produce. We're reliant on our growers, hundreds of growers in the area area to produce a variety of products for us and then we can handle the customer service we can do the outreach and the education we Good can idea. make banger videos every day on TikTok and instagram and manage all that so that we can kind of be a, a hub a, a middleman for this community of agricultural e-commerce here and that we can produce and spread the fruits throughout the u.s beautiful what about these little guys that's a caviar lime oh that's you're gonna have fun with that one do i eat it i'll show you how to eat it take this and then you squeeze out the pearls. Is it just like this? Yeah. Oh, wow. It's like lemon caviar. Dude, that's sick. <laughs> yeah, it's like lemon caviar. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the packaging too. I so, think it's important. Our packaging is completely recyclable and biodegradable. So you can just chuck this in the garden if you want, use it as mulch. This paper is recycled paper already and uh, we use it to make our pillows, which is made from recycled wood shavings. And then our box itself is made from recycled paper. We're trying to do our part to the, for the planet, and I think the customer appreciates that as well, that everything is, is upcycled and recycled and, and has the minimal impact. Hang on, huh? before you ship it over to me, yeah, we you get, we get more. more. <laughs> mm. What percentage of fruit that you sell comes from your farm as opposed mm -hmm. to other growers? Most of farm is only one year in the ground. This, the fruit trees are produced in three to five years. So probably about five to 10% is produced here. Oh wow. And the okay. rest is, is produced at other growers. And in the future, we'll probably be a bigger chunk, about 20 to 30% here. That's what you're shooting for? We're, I, I think we're gonna have a great diversity of offerings that are gonna be extremely popular. It'll just take some time for us to do the research and development to figure out which varieties are gonna be viable in this, in this climate zone. How much money do you spend on average per month on advertising and what platforms give you the best return on your investment? So for the first uh, seven or eight years of business, we didn't spend a dollar on advertising. We didn't spend any money at all. So Just don't free think social media stuff. Social media, sending people boxes, like I said before, paid advertisements are just one type of advertising. Don't think that it's everything. We started paying for advertisements a couple years ago and as long as they're doing their job and returning on their investment, we're happy to pay for them. And we currently pay anywhere between 30 and 50 grand a month on, on paid advertising. That's huge. And so rain. in growing a business from scratch, you don't have that kind of money to spend. So we've invested in that now. And wow. the goal and the hopes is to reach new customers that will be lifelong customers. But break that 30 to 50K per month down. How, how is it spent? On uh, essentially, you know, Facebook, Google ads, you know, Facebook covers Instagram and now we're starting with TikTok ads and then Google covers YouTube and Google and placement on, you know, web browsers and such. And this is more, again, Adele's expertise, right? So I can't yeah. extract the golden nuggets out of you because well, you I don't think, really handle that or what do you I think? I think it's, a, it's an ecosystem of its own advertising and it's good to get with somebody who's a professional who can guide you and... So are you saying hire a marketing professional? Does Adele have a background in that? She knows from experience, but not from education. But I think it's more important to try all the options available to you. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Diversify your, your advertising as well. So these are a red custard apple, and when and the fruit the ripens, it gets about this big, and it tastes like raspberry yogurt. So red custard apple, but mm -hmm. it tastes like raspberry yogurt. Raspberry yogurt. They're not native to Florida. Well, no, nothing's really native to Florida other than alligators. Yeah. So 
And you know, so like, you're experimenting, will it grow here? Will it not? grow here? Yeah, especially with climate change, we're not getting the frost we used to get every year. So a lot of these fruits like soursop, we can grow now that in the past that no one's been able to grow. This one, it's similar in the same family. It's called sapodilla. And when it's ripe, it tastes like brown sugar. And you spoon it out and it's sweet as sugar. Fruits taste like raspberry yogurt. Uh, Sweet potato, potato pie, pie and brown sugar. Brown sugar. I mean, yeah. give. What's the funkiest taste? But that will shock everyone that's watching. Well, there's durian, which is the king of the fruits, and that's a crazy tasting one. And then, if you what want does something, it taste like though durian. Ah, uh, tastes like French onion soup ice cream. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about um, composting or recycling, because I know you're dealing with products that spoil, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how does that look like for your farm? Give us the insights on that. Right, so reduce, reuse, recycle, right? So we're trying to harvest exactly what we need for orders, minimize losses first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Then anything that we can't ship because it's too ripe, we'll either try to sell locally to other farmers market, you know, people that sell at farmers markets, or donate it to a food bank. And then in the case of fruit that's damaged, that it's got smushed at the bottom of a box, it's just not edible, we'll compost that. Or even the tops of pineapples, leaf litter, anything that's left over surplus mm -hmm. from our production, we'll Everything compost. Everything can be reused. Yeah, and we've got, what, two, three containers back yeah, here? Yeah, so we have our compost bins that we cure and compost anything that's left over. After it's finished composting, we grow bananas in it. So the, the compost feeds the bananas and then we have rare bananas. Bananas specifically like the compost or? Bananas are just easy to grow. Gotcha. So we, we put the bananas in there and they can never eat enough. So <laughs> the more food for banana, the better. They're like hungry teenagers. <laughs> That's awesome. Talk to us what you look for in the suppliers that you choose to work with. Are you looking for a certain standard, certain yeah. quality? How does that work for you? Well, the, the fruit quality is first and foremost, but as far as working with suppliers, I think it's important to create meaningful relationships with the people that you Absolutely. work with. You know, everyone wants to work together for a long time, and, and uh, if you go in there and just slashing prices and being a cutthroat entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you know, typically you'll get chewed up and spit out. But you're paying them something, and yeah. somebody else can pay them more mm -hmm. or less. How, mm -hmm. how, how important is the price as well? Well, price is important, consistency is important, when you talk about a uh, perishable product, you know, the stuff gets ripe and you gotta sell it. You can't just go in to, and, and commit to buying everything a grower produces if you don't if you don't know how much you can move. Yeah. So I think it's important to have clear communication with the grower. Don't bite off more than you can chew and, and really, you know, lay your cards out for them, show them where you're at and what you're willing to take on. Well, this has been incredible. I love interviewing farmers or farms yeah. of any kind. Uh, guys, check him out. We've got a couple farm interviews. They did great, and I think you'll learn a lot as well. But in conclusion, what can you tell our audience who are in the farming world, agriculture world of any kind, what's the number one advice that you want to give them, or two or three yeah. that comes to mind? I think it's really important to work with your community, work mm -hmm. with other growers. We have competition, but the less competition we have in a sort of cutthroat sense, the more we can work together and learn from each other, the more stable our economy is going to be. And, and you'll find that when you work with other people and you share with them knowledge, they're going to come back with you and give you the same in return. So try to work together, rely on other people. We're all reliant on each other. So mm -hmm. the more we can do that, you know, the, the stronger your business is gonna be. That's awesome. Sounds like yeah. you cannot have farming without community. Yeah, Like absolutely. it's so intertwined. So absolutely. It's been cool. Thank you so much, Thank Rain. Thank you. Mm. You know what? Let's just cut it right here. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a wrap, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this incredibly sweet, delicious episode with Rain, the owner of Miami Fruit. All the exotics in the world that you want, they're the place to go. Hope you enjoyed it. Learned some things about farming, being unique, creative. Execute on everything we share. We appreciate you watching. Take a second to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you don't miss any of our videos. Stay tuned for amazing episodes to come.